strategies and concepts discussed are for educational purposes only and do not represent specific investment, tax, or estate planning advice. Investing carries an inherent element of risk, and it is in everyone's best interest to consult a tax, legal, or investment professional. Beth Williams is an investment advisor representative of, and advisory services are offered through, USA Financial Securities Corp., a registered investment advisor. Megan Carney, Megan S. Carney PLLC, and Financial Art Builders are not affiliated with USA Financial Securities Corp. Welcome to Money Healing. I'm your co-host, Beth Williams. And I'm your other co-host, Megan Carney. We're here to talk about money and our feelings related to it. I'm a psychologist who specializes in helping sensitive people. And I'm a financial planner. We both talk to everyday people just like you about these topics. Everyone's mental health and money health journeys are so different. And as unique as we all are, there are some common themes when it comes to how our emotions impact our money and vice versa. And it's those common themes that we are going to be discussing together, both the themes themselves and some ideas from us about how to move forward and heal your relationship with money. In the next bit of episodes, Megan and I will be unpacking the various emotions and trauma themes that we've encountered within our observations over the last few years. We discovered that people fell into one of two camps, one that knows their numbers and where they are financially, and those that don't know their numbers and where they are financially. We recommend that you go through the episodes and listen to the ones you believe may apply to you. Megan and I are big advocates for getting collaborative support for both your mental health and your financial health journey. As you listen, we recommend that you pay attention to yourself, your reactions emotionally, and reach out to either a mental health professional and or a financial professional to help you deal with your relationship with money. We'll begin by discussing, I don't know my numbers and blank. Is there something that comes after that? Emotional themes we'll discuss within that will be fear, avoidance, what happens if I lose or fail, shame, guilt, and even domestic violence and abuse with the overarching theme of trauma. We will then discuss, I know my numbers and blank. Some of the emotional themes that we'll discuss within that will be hopelessness, fear, shame, embarrassment, burnout, never enough, feeling lost, undervalued, worry, and then we'll also deal with the overarching theme of trauma. Welcome to this next episode of Money Healing. We today are going to be talking about not getting help and a big piece of that being because I feel like I can't possibly retire. I have no idea when I could retire and isn't that all that financial planning is about is retirement? It certainly seems that way, doesn't it? <laughs> That's how it feels sometimes. I remember like the first time that I was even introduced to the idea of a financial planner, it was because the company that I was working for would once a year bring in a financial planner for everybody to talk to, um, to figure out like what you were saving for retirement. That was it. Yeah, I think that that's probably one of the disconnects that we have in in our world is that we don't get financial help because we don't feel like we're at this stage of life that we have enough money to go to someone. And we've talked about that in a previous episode, too. But um, as as you already know, thank you to our audience that uh, I love to define things. And one of the things that I want to define for this episode specifically is what we mean when we say retirement. Uh, because that's that's a big broad term. Um, we have the belief that retirement is when you stop doing what you have to do and you start doing what you want to do, even if that's the same thing. So an example of that would be uh, we have a bunch of clients that were in ministry of some sort. Uh, maybe they were pastors, maybe they were missionaries, but they love what they do. And there's so much of a drive to get up in the morning and to feel like they're making a difference in the world. And they would love to just, you know, die at their desk preparing for a sermon kind of thing. They just love what they do. Um, we have some therapists that are clients as well, and they just love 
making a difference in their world. And so I think for for us and when we're starting to talk to somebody, it's really important to just unpack what does that actually mean to you? What does that look like? And maybe it is that you're already retired right now. Uh, maybe you're just doing this because you really want to. And it's a really powerful moment, I think, to be able to stop and go, oh, you know what? I'm doing this out of my own choice, not because I have to, but because I want to do this. So I think maybe one of the things to think about for yourself when you're starting to think about what retirement means for you is really what is what does that build out to be? You're going to be doing something with your time. Maybe it makes you money. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's a side gig. Um, maybe it's that you want to volunteer more. I don't know. And so I think that that's a really big moment to just stop and and really define what that means for, for you. Um, that being the case, there's oftentimes roadblocks in our heads that may or may not be a reality of what we can and cannot do. And again, I would go back and I would define what is that, what does that phase of life actually look like? Mm -hmm. I'm curious about like what those roadblocks are, but before you even go there, you know, you're talking about the group of people who are like, they would want to keep doing something uh, after retirement. And I also know the group of people who cannot wait to retire and not have to work anymore, not have to punch a clock, be able to travel whenever and wherever they want to, or maybe just not even do anything, but just finally rest because they were in a really strenuous job for a really long time and they want to just be. And that can be retirement too. So I would say roadblocks that are made up in our heads are, again, not defining what retirement actually is. And so I may not have enough money or I may have um, to work some more. And those may or may not be a reality based on, again, defining what retirement actually means to you, the individual. A roadblock that could actually exist is that you have something in your mind that you want to accomplish and you maybe don't have the right timing. Maybe it's not the right decade to do whatever it is that you're trying to do. Um, maybe it's that you um, don't actually have enough money to fund this lifestyle that you want. And so, of course, there's never going to be a perfect answer. And oftentimes as we go, there are some changes uh, to what it is that we actually want to do. But I think that we make up things in our heads, again, that, that may or may not be a reality, again, based off of what we're actually defining that retirement to mean for us. Yeah, I'm thinking about the people who just say, and, and I know some of these people personally, like, I'm just, ne I'm just never going to be able to retire. I'm going to be working until I die. Is that a, a mental roadblock that we're making up? Is it a real roadblock? Is it both? It might be both. And I would go back to the episode that we talk about where um, we talk about how it feels like it's hopeless mm -hmm. and it it could mean retirement. It could mean, you know, a goal or an idea that you have in your head, whatever that is. Um, but the the hopelessness, I would I would say again, I'm usually more optimistic than my clients are. Um, but if we're thinking that we have to retire and and that means that we're going to be golfing all of the time, or that means that we're going to be babysitting our grandkids. Uh, it, it really just has to deal with the individual on what that phase means to you. And it, again, may or may not be a reality. And as I think we've tried to really drive home is like, that's where the financial planner comes in, right? Is that dose of reality, looking at the windshield, looking to the future and saying like, well, this is where it stands now. These are some things that you could do to get yourself closer to this goal that you are trying to hit based on what you actually want. 
And sometimes we have to do things. Again, that's why we say retirement is when you stop doing what you have to do and you start doing what you want to do. There are times where we have to do certain things and we have to make a certain amount of money because we have a special needs kid that, you know, has has something that your needs have to be put aside to be able to take care of whatever's going on. And there's a phase and a time for everything. But if we come to the conversation and we're saying, you know what, I have had to do for the last 30 years this job and I hate it and I never want to ever step in the door again, then oftentimes what we'll do is we'll talk to the client about maybe taking a year off to just have a sabbatical of some sort and really reassess who am I in this phase of of life and maybe I don't have to do this anymore. Maybe the person that I've been trying to take care of is is okay. And so we're gonna have a reality check about who am I and what is it that I value and what is it that I wanna do in this next in this next phase of what is it that I want to do. And I do think that that's a, a really exciting time. It's, it's a point in time where the world is your oyster, kind of like it was when you just got out of college or high school. And it's a little, it's a little nerve wracking. And so that's one of the reasons why we'll take a, a, you know, just a lot of time to just reassess. And maybe again, it's a little sabbatical. Maybe it's that you do some sort of a walkabout and you find yourself and, and you just go back into something that you really love to do. Maybe it doesn't pay as much. Maybe you don't need it to pay as much, but it's something that you want and and for me personally, I love what I do and I will probably never stop working because I really want to do this. And and so arguably, maybe I am retired. You know, <laughs> there's there's certainly things that I have to do, but there's certainly things and parts of this element that bring me purpose and joy and and pleasure. And, and that's something that I want. Yeah, yeah. And I think you and I are fortunate to be in this space where We're both doing work that brings us an income that works for us in our lives. And it's work that we enjoy, right? And you brought up a really big question in this like year sabbatical type of space about discovering like who you are again. And that is such a big, scary idea for a lot of people especially when our identity can get really wrapped up into our job, right? Like in the U.S., that is a very common first set of questions type of thing when you meet somebody is, oh, what do you do for work, right? It becomes, whether you want it to or not, this part of who you are, And that can be a really scary and intimidating thing for people to like take this space off and be like, who am I? I don't know. I was a car salesman for 20 years or whatever it is that you were doing that you didn't enjoy. I think it's a really great phase. And again, it's really exciting to just go back and I mean, what did you want to be when you were six years old? You know, can we can we do that? And again, there's there's parts of all of us, I think, that we want to feel like we're participating in society and that we're we're doing something that's that's grand and and awesome. And I, I, like you said, I mean, when you're at a cocktail party, that's the second question that somebody's going to ask you next to what is your name? They're going to ask you, what is it that you do for a living? And being able to answer the question of I'm trying to reassess that right now, or I'm trying to, um, you know, go into this new phase and and do it the way that I want to do it. I think it's really exciting, but it can feel a little like, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> yes, yes. There's um another therapist, former therapist that I follow and listen to. Her name's Megan Meganson. Because Megan's are awesome. Let's just be real about that. <laughs> But she uh, talks about this as like being in the void. And I've also heard it uh, referred to as the fertile void. Uh, I'm not sure who said that. But I love that that idea of like, this is the, the place where you are like, if this were a garden, you are 
putting in fertilizer and tending to the soil so that something really beautiful can grow. I think giving space and time and being able to let that happen and let yourself feel those emotions is another reason why we'll we'll you know recommend taking a little bit of time off and just just think about it. Um, another another point was that um, we have a, a client that used to be a football coach and I went to him for some advice and he was saying you know you're really the cheerleader you're really the coach you know for these people that are feeling um, like they they need somebody to help them through the financial picture and he had said you know unfortunately there's no scoreboard really when it comes to you know, our finances, <laughs> we, we can, we can look up at the scoreboard when we're playing football or when we're playing a sport and we can know where the score is and we need, we can know where we're at. And there's really no scoreboard when it comes to finances. And I thought that that was a very interesting insight. It is. And I don't know, I think maybe there's more parallels there than there aren't because when you're coaching football or any sport, you're not just coaching during the game. You're coaching during practice, during all those times between games. And that matters possibly even more than during the game. And at those times, you don't have that like super physical concrete scoreboard. But you do have things that you're working towards. You do have goals in mind. There is some achievement, some growth that is happening there. And I think the same or similar can be said of financial planning. Like, yeah, there can be like this dashboard of like, this is where we are now. And this is your goal. So there is like, this growth so that we are working towards. And even though it's not like a super solid, you're either winning the game or you're losing the game, it's not all that matters, right? Like we both follow some sports. And to me, what has always mattered more is that it's like a good, exciting game, right? At, yes, it's better if your team wins. <laughs> But if it's a good, exciting game, a competitive game, and everyone's doing their best and you can see that, that's way better, right? You've seen that, oh, this team has grown over the season. That's way better. And so we're seeing that with financial planning, I think, that like, yeah, we're we're seeing that some growth is adding in to our savings or our assets are increasing. Uh, and so we, we do still have that. And you're part of that. A financial planner is part of that, of helping us see those, that we're reaching those benchmarks and of cheering us along that like, hey, you can get there. Like, hey, if you just put in you know, 20 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever it is to this particular account, by the end of 10 years, here's where it'll be. Wondered if maybe part of the problem was there wasn't a lot of communication between, you know, his experience of financial planning versus what we have in our heads as financial planners. There, There is kind of a scoreboard not really but there's indicators that we can look at and I really again to reference some other episodes I really think that my job is to not tell you you need to do this you need to do that my job is really to show you what happens if you do this or if you do that between choices a b and c this is the outcome and there are indicators and there are things that we're going to be looking at, but it might not necessarily be obvious to you. And maybe we could do a better job of communicating that, you know, to the individual about what what that actually looks like and what that scoreboard, you know, is. But I mean, Megan, when I've got people coming into me and they're asking me questions about, I don't know if I can retire, what emotions do you think they're coming up with and, and what should we do about those? Well, I think there's a fair amount of hopelessness that's coming up when you're saying, I can never retire. I'm going to work until the day I die. And like, 
what a sad thing, right? Because they're just going to clear off your desk if you have a desk and bring in the next person. And I hope that's not the reality that you're living in. Uh, and you won't know that. You won't know what level of hope there is until you talk to a financial planner. And we've got a whole episode on hopelessness. So if, if that's what you're feeling, go back and listen to that, <laughs> please. Because chances are there's more hope than you realize. I think the other feeling that comes up, um, especially for those of us who are younger, is this um, anger and maybe resentment of like, it is not fair anymore. The way that things used to be, the things that you could depend on with fair a fair amount of certainty, nothing's 100% certain, never, uh, but you can pretty much count on years ago, do not exist in that form anymore. And, and I don't know all the history and reasons why, but, you know, I think about my grandfather who worked for one company for a long period of his life and was able to count on a retirement fund, was able to recount, was able to count on a pension uh, that he still receives. It still exists for him. And with those things, you know, they've been able to invest a lot. They've been able to save a lot. They have enough that their child with special needs is going to be okay for all the support she needs for the rest of her life. Their other child is going to be just fine. Their grandchildren, myself included, are going to be okay because they have been able to save so much because they could count on this thing that we just don't have anymore, which feels so unfair, right? Because my my grandfather, it was a working class job, like blue collar job where you got this pension and that is just not the reality that it is anymore. And I think that that's very fair. Um, like you said, there's not a lot of conversation around why that is and why those changes have occurred. And, you know, I, I'm more than happy to, to answer those, you know, if you want to uh, give me a call or, or email me. And we've talked about a little bit of that in previous episodes as well. But I think sometimes when we're looking at, okay, this is what I want and and I can't get there because of this reason or that reason, we we try to separate these out into those those two categories and we've talked about this before but what those things are that we can control and those things that we can't and oftentimes we as humans seem to focus on what it is that we can't control more than what it is that we can and you know the history of all of those different pieces are very very relevant and and we are seeing the effects of those you know globally and yet those are things that are outside of our control um, so I think that sometimes it's easier to understand those two different areas and then, okay, how do we improve what it is that we can control and how do we direct that going forward? And maybe that might help with some of those emotions. I absolutely agree, Beth, because when we're stuck in that like anger and resentment of like, this isn't reality for us anymore. We don't know what social security is going to be, right? I know lots of people who are <laughs> very concerned about that. And that's out of our control. We don't know what's going to happen there. We can't bring back emotions, at least not easily. <laughs> um, but when we only focus on those things that we can't control, and it's easy to get lost on focusing on those things that we can't control. We forget that there's this whole other side that we do have some level of control over, but we could be taking some control over our financial future if we were to work with a financial planner, if we were to take charge of what we're investing in or how we're investing or how much 
much we're putting aside on a regular basis, assuming that's available to us. So to wrap this all up, if you're like, oh, I, I can't retire and that's all that financial planning is about, <laughs> one, remember there's more to financial planning than retirement. Retirement can mean many different things. And if there are a lot of feelings coming up with me about that, that is normal. We go back to some of those previous episodes regarding some of those feelings that we've recorded already. And get a real good view of the future. Work with a financial planner to take control of the pieces that you can't control because we can't control it. I hope you'll join us on our next episode where we're getting even deeper. For those of you who are thinking like retirement, I haven't even thought that far in the future. I can't think that far in the future. The next episode is definitely for you.